Hi, and welcome to the Org Dev Podcast. So organization development is the discipline that has the power to transform organizations, shape cultures, and empower individuals. Yet it's often sort of shrouded in mystery. So in these series of podcasts that we're running called the Org Dev Podcast, we're pulling back the curtain of organization development to reveal what it is. And the best way we can do it is by inviting a guest practitioner who is out in the field, who's driving real and significant change and innovation in really interesting organizations. And we're inviting them to share what they're doing and how they're doing it in this organization. So in this episode, we're really delighted to invite the brilliant Kenny Tamuo, and he is Leadership and Culture and Talent and Innovation for UK and EMEA at Netflix. Now, you've definitely probably heard of Netflix, but sometimes we might forget about the sort of the scale and the size of Netflix. So just give you a little bit, a bit of a refresh. So, you know, Netflix since 2013 has gone from 34 million subscribers to, is it quarter of a billion now? Kenny, yeah, well, well done. Yeah, good. good I've good done job. my homework. Um, and <laughs> I, I actually looked this up as a stat and I couldn't actually believe this was true. So in 2022, it spent $16.7 billion on content. I mean, I, I can fact check that off the top of my head, but you're, no doubt I trust your research. So, uh, and it's, you know, it, we do invest a, a ton of money on, on the content for sure. So yeah, we're talking about, um, yeah, quite a lot of growth of money. Brilliant. So it just gives you a, a real sort of scale because the story of Netflix is one of growth. And so it's going to be a really fascinating part as Kenny starts to introduce the work that he's doing and sharing with you just the, a little bit more about the culture of Netflix as well. So I'm joined by my colleague, Danny. Hello. Brilliant. So Danny joins us uh, on our podcast um, and we'll be asking Kenny lots of questions and being very curious about lots of things as well. So, Danny, do you want to just kick us off with Kenny, if that's OK? Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Kenny. We're going to kick off with an easy one. So just tell us a bit about your role. Kind of what is, what is it you do at Netflix? What does it involve? Thanks, Danny. Yeah. So happy to be here, everybody. And, and thanks, Aaron, for the introduction as well. So, yeah, Kenny Temo, I, I basically involved in everything to do with kind of the talent space at Netflix in the UK and uh, and in EMEA as well, particularly Amsterdam, where it's, it's, it's uh, our, um, our EMEA headquarters. So EMEA, for people who don't know, stands for Europe, Middle East um, and Africa. And so, you know, if you think about the journey from when people are hired into an organization, everything from how do you help them acclimatize to the culture? You know, how do you help them develop the sort of habits and the ways of working that will help them to be successful to how you help leaders and teams work effectively together how you then grow them and, and think about internal mobility uh, to, you know, in some cases, you know, you know, helping leaders have exit conversations. So is that entire what we call, you know, the employee life cycle? And then on top of that, you know, thinking about um, what we, what you might, I guess, traditional OD work, where I will work, often work with HR business partners and, um, you know, be looking at sort of targeted interventions there. Um, and then on, and then lastly, we're a region, right? But the, the global HQ is in LA. So then the other piece is, you know, how do you help that interface between um, what's happening in the region and what's happening um, globally? So in short, that's a bit of a flavor of what my role entails. Sounds really interesting. Lots to get your teeth into there. Yeah. So you talked about acclimatizing people to the culture of Netflix. What's the biggest challenge I guess people face when they when they join your organization? So, you know, if you imagine, um, and, and Garen was talking about our... Uh, you know, the context for us as a business. And if you imagine people coming from somewhere like the BBC, for example, you know, national treasure institution, but very different culturally to, to Netflix, <clears throat> or coming from any other, you know, whether it be Disney, so any other TV media company or others where it's quite hierarchical. I think the first biggest shift is, um, yes, hierarchy exists at Netflix, you know, in any sort of social space, there's an ex element of a hierarchy but um, just much less than other companies. There's much more freedom. Uh, you're not sort of, you're not handheld at Netflix. So, you know, we're quite famous for giving people unlimited leave and people not having to track their leave anywhere. So as something as tactical as that, um, you can see sort of someone who comes to Netflix and sort of says, well, well, gosh, how do I, there's all manner of questions that comes up for them. So there's a cultural piece in terms of sort of the process, the lack of process. So we, 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 we try to have minimal processes is what I'd say. Um, uh, the other piece is acclimatizing to our feedback culture. So uh, one of the things that's, uh, you know, again, I think Netflix has been famous for in the culture memo that, that we uh, published some years ago is this piece around candor and being honest. Um, and I always try to turn people's attention to the why of that. 
and part of that is because there's a lot of there's an entrepreneurial sort of startup energy in if you like at netflix and because we often pivot and we we change and make decisions uh quite quickly so adverts we didn't used to have ads on this service and now we've got ads i mean i should check do you both have a netflix account i don't know the, absolutely, the answer, yeah. Yeah. that was the proviso for you coming along is that we've got <laughs> netflix <laughs> subscriptions we do <laughs> we do yeah. and so I, I you don't have to share i don't know which sort of tier you have whether you had have the ads or not but ads was something that we didn't have on the service and and we needed to pivot you know and so what comes with that is the ability what, what enables that is the ability to give very quick feedback to each other because if you're going in the wrong direction you need feedback to let you know that so you can move in a different direction so you know these cultural tenants and principles are all in service i guess of a sort of a broader organizational vision so yeah it's a good question danny i'd say those are some of the immediate things it's the sort of the, the reduced sense of hierarchy and the sort of greater transparency and the the sort of um uh, the challenge and invitation to give feedback. Uh, now there's a tension there because we're scaling and growing as the company and some of those things are needing to change. So, you know, maybe we might come and come on to that a bit later. Yeah. And you mentioned um, anyone with an interest in organization culture will have seen the slide deck. So there's a slide deck and we'll put the reference in the show notes for this, which is the freedom responsibility slide deck, which is an astonishing slide deck uh, that was put together a number of years ago by one of sort of the founding HR people. And is it um, uh, Reed Hastings? Is that, that right? Who's, who set the organization yeah, Reed up? Reed Hastings and Paddy McCord. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's an astonishing piece because it's, it's open source. Anyone can read it. And it really lays out the aspiration, the values of the organization, so that when people join, they understand what they're getting themselves into, like they're kind of, they're exposed to it already and the, and the pace. It, it, is that a very deliberate thing to make sure to increase the chances that you do get the right candidates join? That's a really good question. I think I remember when I read um, Reed Hastings' book and, and my colleagues who, who might listen to this might need to correct me on this, but I, I'm pretty sure um, the 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 original tension wasn't wasn't that wasn't necessarily to uh um i think influence um you know potential employees but I rem if i remember correctly that that was a sort of unintended consequence that actually it it meant that you um i guess you know you attract you know like attracts like i guess you know and you sort of attracted people who wanted to work at that sort of sort of culture so yeah there was quite a um uh a number of benefits to sort of publicizing um, the culture in that way, you know, of course, what, what that means internally from an old perspective as well is, you know, what, what does it mean to be an organization that has such strong values and such a strong culture, but is moving in a slightly different direction and, and there's sort of a tension that exists um, between folk who have been here for a long time and who remember the quote unquote heydays of, um, you know, the early 2000s or whatever, or the, you know, 2010s. And um, and now we're sort of operating slightly differently. So um, that that's a really interesting one where the culture has been codified in that way. And you know, if you think of a Venn diagram and between, uh, yeah, we all love a good Venn diagram, don't we? Um, between sort of, yeah, yeah right, the, the aspiration of the culture and the sort of lived experience. I think it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. It's not a complete, it's sort of overlapping. Um, and that um, that brings about some interesting tensions for sure. Yeah, most things in life can be fixed with a Venn diagram. I think that's a really nice thing. It's like it is an aspiration. It's something that we're working towards as well. And it's like having an honest conversation about where we are as well. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you get into Netflix then, Kenny? What was your journey to kind of working there? Hmm. What was my journey? So I, I guess maybe if I work backwards. So before Netflix, I was at a, a games sort of metaverse company uh, called Improbable. And this was a startup or a scale up at the time. Uh, they'd long gone from sort of your 50 people in a, a cupboard, a small room with a cupboard in London into a, a thousand person global organization. And so whilst not as big as, as Netflix, it was uh, doing, they were doing some you know, very cool, almost magical things with engineers and, and in the sort of gaming and tech world, they had a defense business. And so there's a lot of complexities there in terms of thinking about the organization because we had, so we had the games and tech business, we had the, um, the defense business, we had a business in China, we had teams in Canada and America, and um, you know you can probably already think politically. There was just a lots of nuances there, so that was very interesting. And before that, I was at a consulting firm, so doing lots of work with the likes of Rolls Royce, BBC, Johnson and Johnson, uh, Ministry of uh, Justice, so government work, 
Um, I mean, I won't go through, I won't bore you in my entire career history, I guess, but I guess in short, my trajectory into Netflix was quite a, I think, an untraditional one. I started out in the creative arts as a lecturer at a sixth form college in, in London, uh, did some coaching, trained to coach, and then took different opportunities. Um, and then somehow Netflix came, came knocking. So I wish there was a recipe <laughs> that I could share. Uh, but yeah, that's a bit of my, bit of my journey. Well, it's interesting because we've done lots of research interviews with different organization development practitioners and there's no one pathway. And a lot of the time, you know, the one sort of constant theme is that people kind of find OD. It's like either sort of like they stumble across it or they're frustrated about how change happens and they, they sort of uh, uh, find it. And then it's often quite um, transformative in people's careers as well. So how did you sort of discover OD? Yeah, I think it was probably through the consulting work. That was where, um, well, I mean, after after I left public education in the sixth form college work I was doing, um, I did some training in in sort of um, uh, mapping organizational. It was called sort of mapping organizational motivation, and it was thinking about how do you understand the motivation of teams and using psychometrics with that to sort of do some of that um, sort of psychological work and organizational thinking, and that this inspired me i guess along that along those lines and eventually landed in a consulting firm and of course when you're in a consulting firm you're sort of flown into lots of different um almost i mean probably not the best analogy given what's happening in the world but it, it felt like you were flown into these theaters of war where you had to sort of just find work out the problem and be this kind of sport team um uh, very quickly help the client you know what it's like right and so yeah. that um i think that gave me a bit of a taste uh for or OD work where you're you know you're really trying to map out the system and understand the sort of lay of the land and then in that consulting firm you know because people are your your products I guess for want of a better word when you're consulting you know lots of internal development so it was through a lot of that internal development that I, I guess I acquired quite a taste um, for OD and then when I joined Netflix the, the the function I joined was learning and organizational development so th there was already quite a, an interest in OD work at Netflix. And what bits do you, of your role do you enjoy most? What, what is it about OD that draws you in? Ooh, uh, I just love thinking about really big thorny problems, you know, at the organisational level. I love thinking about it. I love thinking about um, strategy. I love thinking about um, how different parts of the organisation impact each other. Um, I love doing the team coaching work, um, working with leaders and through leaders, um, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I guess I've, having a psychological background as well, I, I'm often thinking about just the dynamics of um, how different teams interact. And Danny, you and I were on a, a course a little little while back, and and yeah. I, I was attracted to that program, you know, for that sort of very reason. Um, so yeah, I think um, yeah, I'd probably say it's just thinking about hard, thorny problems, being able to step back and observe, uh, and how they interact, and and then obviously help develop and design solutions around it. Well, I can't imagine there's any lack of big thorny problems in an organization as complex and as fast moving as, no. as Netflix as well. I guess is 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 the challenge trying to sort of identify which big thorny problems to prioritize and work on and where you can add the most value. Yeah, exactly. And it was <clears throat> similar when I was in my last company where I did a lot of DNI work there as well on top of um, the culture stuff and leadership work and OD work. Um I think there's this there's this sort of piece around when you think about an organizational system you know where can you apply um where can you apply the pressure in a way that will have an outsized kind of impact because you know hr teams are often think you know l d teams are thinking about lots and lots of programs and whatnot um and and to your point garen i think i've, I've started thinking just differently about the work i do and starting to think more around um you know where where is the problem to your point and where can we sort of if we do something here how will that impact something over there so i guess thinking in a really sort of systemic way as well. you're you're a, you're a true od practitioner is that you never take things at face value do you it's always like so what so what what is that underpinning this as well yeah yeah no exactly we've talked a bit about what you enjoy what are the most challenging aspects of of your role working in od yeah um what are the most challenging aspects Oh, where do you start? Um, I think one of, I think the context of my role in Netflix in the UK and Amir is that 
you know, we're a region, and as I said, the global, the global HQ is in LA, and, and so there's an immediate challenge there, um, in terms of you know, ultimately, all the budget sits there, really. If, you know, if you want to be blunt about it, um, and and that's the center of gravity in many ways. <clears throat> Although that said, on the consumer side, you know, the business is thriving and growing faster in the other regions like APAC and, and EMEA. Um, so I think one of the challenges is just being in a global team, but having a regional, a local role. And, and so I'm in three teams effectively. I have um, key stakeholders in London, the sort of what we call a team one mindset. So Patrick Lencioni wrote a book called The Advantage and he talks about you know having a team one mindset. So I've got sort of multiple team ones, uh, sort of UK, and then I've got my EMEA team, and then the sort of global team. And that that spawns all manner of different weird things on Slack where you've just got multiple channels you're trying to sort of um, uh, kind of monitor. So that is definitely a challenge, just emotionally as well, because you feel connected and feel sort of allegiances and you feel that you need to manage relationships at different levels. So I would say that's one of the big kind of sort of operational um, challenges for sure. There'll certainly be lots that, are, that will come to my mind, but I also want to give you a chance to ask the questions. Yeah, well, I, I guess it's interesting, isn't it? Because if the center of gravity and, and there's lots of organizations which are asymmetrical, it's just there's an HQ, isn't there, or whatever. Um, and, but you're not even in a similar time zone. So you're not necessarily communicating. A lot of it's your work will be done sort of asynchronously. Like yeah. as an organization, what do you kind of do to, or what do you personally do to sort of overcome that? Yeah, it's, I, I can only say it is, it is a challenge. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we do the, the practical things of you know switching the time zones when we have said all the where we place the calendar invites so that it, you know so people in APAC can, can join and you know we'll, we'll record all the meetings so people can watch it but I would say it's I just think it's a operationally it's a difficult one uh, and I was just actually asked to having a feedback conversation with a colleague in the US and I was just saying um you know I, I'm feeling the crunch of these different teams and, and we've just got to continue to work through it and try to communicate well. But Slack is a great tool for that, of course. Um, uh, but it does put a strain in that, to your question, Gary, and sometimes I'll be up till quite late, um, picking up when the Americans, you know, get up and then having conversations there. And sometimes they will, of course, have to get up really early, five, six in the morning to have calls. So I think it does certainly put a strain. And I'd love to hear of any companies that do the sort of global communications and interactions really really well because i think it's just i think you just do the best you can and and keep moving yeah i don't think we can really help with that we we were facilitating the session where we did we had someone who was up at midnight in asia we were like middle of the day and we and the guys in america were like it was at four or five a.m wasn't it so, <laughs> it was a real so challenge to, it was it was the away day with everyone at different ends of the tide and the spectrum i think <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. No, exactly. I'm, I'm dying for you to ask, what does a typical day look like? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one I want. <laughs> uh, what does a typical day look like? Um, All week, because sometimes our days are so different. But I guess it's it's yeah. that kind of people are understand. I'm, I'm doing OD, but, but how do you construct your day? How do you sort of yeah. design your day? How do you organise your priorities? Like, what what does it look like for you? Yeah, it's a good question, and and um, you know, and and. The, the context as well is that some of my work is split between, you know, there's more programmatic work nowadays than the OD um, stuff, at least, you know, um, in the way I conceive of OD and a lot of the targeted interventions, um, systemic interventions, um, you know, team level interventions and things like that. So there's still a lot of programmatic work. So if I think about a week, um, I wish I could say it starts with, you know, watching the trailer or watching a video for our latest show that's coming out or whatever. Um, uh, but usually, um, so I work from home probably a couple of days a week and then our, our UK office is in Oxford Circus. And I love going into the office because there's such a vibe there. There's just such a buzz and such an energy. And I, I, when I'm in the office, I often try to do the things that I can't do when I'm working from home. So that's, you know, be with people, spend time with people. My, my, um, my line manager often says, you know, Kenny, if you spend time with us in the sort of HR world, then there's probably a bit of a, an issue. You need to be with them in the business and sort of just making sure you're understanding the, the challenges. And so that's a big thing that I try and do in my world is um, understand the day-to-day -day challenges. I, I mean, I couldn't stress that anymore. It's like, there's nothing worse than sort of 
um, L and D or OD solutions that come out of an ivory tower. Um, that's that it erodes the impact because um, it's not um, targeting any sort of specific concrete sort of issues and challenges. So I try in terms of my week, I try and spend time where I'm scheduling one to ones, um, having conversations, just understanding what's going on. Um, I'll often scour the Slack channels. I'll go through all the different Slack channels just to get context on what I make sure I'm not missing anything. Check videos or recordings of, of things, and, you know. And there's the usual triaging and going through your emails and and things like that. Um, and then you know there'll be your regular standups with your local team, with your EMEA team, and then global teams. Um, and then the, you know you know the ongoing project work. So um, whether that is preparing for our onboarding, you know, capstone onboarding events that we have, they're sort of big, big show, showpiece events. Um, so whether it's preparing for sort of your ongoing programs or some of our, we've got often pilot things that we're experimenting with. Um, so we do things like peer coaching and training up our peer coaches. So there's things that I'm trying to scale. So I guess I think about it in my head in terms of, um, you know, what are the things that are in building phase where maybe you're building the foundation for something? What are the things that maybe just need to be systematized? So maybe it's more a case of we've piloted it and we're now trying to be more systematic about the sort of launching of it. What are the things which uh, maybe need to be optimized or where there's some innovation that's needed? Um, and that's either the things that already exist or maybe there's something new. Um, so I guess that's one way um, that I sort of try to think through the different pieces of work that I'm, I'm working on. Oh, really and then obviously like having fun in between all of that as well. Yeah, it's so important. The social connection is so important in your role, isn't it? Because that's it, it's, it's a relational role, isn't it? And people have to have that level of trust to see you as a sort of a, a trusted advisor and a strategic yeah. partner as well. I really like that. Building foundation or systemizing or optimizing. We should yeah. break our week down that way, shouldn't we? <laughs> it's a really good way of breaking it down. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so just thinking back to the relationships. So you talked about the importance of the relationships and understanding what's going on. Sounds like that's critical in your ability to be able to kind of support and kind of intervene and almost prevent things before they become big issues. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you know, I'm thinking about a, a concrete example. You know, that I can that I can share. Um, you know, so okay, one example is we you know we have we love a good offsite at Netflix. So we call it offsite. So it's, you know, usually. <laughs> Usually it's in a hotel somewhere, but sometimes it's actually on site. So now we've reverted to saying off site, on site. And I'm just like, why don't we just do a meeting? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it? Um, but we, we we call it off sites for slang. And 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 at these off sites, you know, the time for connection, you usually bring in the HR business partner or myself or both of us. And I might consult on the design of this off site. But in order to consult on the design of this off site, you know, for example, let's say, you know, I talked at the top of the conversation, we're often pivoting and changing, let's say two teams have been brought together. Mm. Um, no, let's just say for argument's sake, you know, our product facing team and consumer team, maybe they're in the one that, that hasn't happened, but let's say that, that, that sort of brought together. Uh, the question is, okay, how do we, you know, how do we work with this group for, for success? How do we create the right kind of climate? You know, how do we help the leader thinking about the culture and the strategy of that team? So there's that sort of consulting with the HR business partner and the leader, but to do that well, to your point, Danny, you know, I've got to know the context. I've got to understand what's their task, what's their day-to-day -day reality. Um, and we had a, a UK offsite, I think it was um, sort of Q2 of this year, and um, we all gathered together. Um, and, and it's a great way of inspiring people in terms of what's what we call the slate. So slate, the program in slate is basically the content that's coming in the, in the in the sort of near future. So we look at the, the UK content slate, we get excited, they show all the trailers of the shows that are coming next year, but we have a sort of a talent HR segment in that. And one of the things that I did for that section is basically asked them a question and I said, look, what are your barriers to execution? Uh, and we use the word execution because there's sort of, it's a, it's, an, it's a key thing we've been thinking about as a company as we've moved to ads and uh, you know, partnering you know, with Microsoft around um, our ads work, a big piece is, well, how do we make sure we execute well in this, with this pivot? And so um, so I asked the, the UK business, say, hey, look, let's we work on different teams, different tables, you know, what's, um, what's the barrier to execution? And there were many different things that came up. 
Um, but one, I mean, there are things like, for example, meetings, too many meetings, you know, which is no surprise it's there, right? But one of the things that came up was around um, who is responsible for doing what? And it came comes back to this, if you're in the UK, you are, you, you may be doing a local UK role, or you may be doing an EMEA role, you might be doing a global role, then you're interfacing into stakeholders in the US. And so there's questions around responsibility, where does responsibility lie for certain things when you're in that matrix structure. Um, and so, again, you know, for me, for us to deliver any solutions to any, I'm conscious this is a long answer, answer to your question, but for us to think about the right solutions to that, um, we've really got to understand the, the problem. I mean, it's, it's classic, right, to change anything, you really need to understand the problem. Uh, and so these offsites are ways of me spending time with people, so having lunch, having breakfast, even dinners, sort of really get get into the nitty gritty of what the, what the problem is. You mentioned like a matrix structure and that really emphasizes the importance of relationships, doesn't it? Because it takes certain types of managers to flourish in that environment and also certain like a, a certain skill set for you know people that provide support services and and uh, and, and strategic advice um, to help them get the right relationships as well because you have to navigate the terrain, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And, and you need to build credibility, right? You know, and build trust. And you have to be seen as someone who, you know, if I'm going to work with our content leaders, for example, you know, our content leaders are, you know, they're creatives. They, um, they, anything that feels too corporate, they sort of shy away from, for the most part, you know, it's a massive generalization, but you can't come into a conversation with a content leader and not know what the titles are that they're working on, not know that, not know you're unscripted from your scripted, from your, to your um, sort of uh, reality TV shows. And, and you've, so you've got to be credible in order to be able to then quote unquote win a seat at the table and be able to influence in that, in that space. Thank you. So if you look back at the work you've done at Netflix, I guess, what, what are you most proud of? What do you feel has had the biggest impact? Ooh, what's had the biggest impact? I'd like to say I'm pausing because I've got, you know, so many examples of, I mean, there are, there are a few at, at Netflix, but I've been there, you know, about 20 months now. So there's, um, it's still somewhat early days, but I think that I'd say starting off with, you know, before I joined, we, we didn't have the sort of rich, for the, for the region, at least, I want to say for the region in EMEA, we didn't have the rich qualitative data about the employee experience. And we've got more work to do, but I spent a good three months just seeking to understand the lay of the land. Um, so again, that semi-structured interviews, doing using all sorts of tools like empathy, persona mapping, um, empathy mapping, um, emotional journeys, just to really understand what 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 is the sort of uh, what are the pain points. And I think that's that's one thing I'm really proud of is is because it means as we go into sort of this next year, it means you've just got more data points uh, and you, you know where you can sort of direct the sort of solutions. And then um, one of the things we, we, um, we did was uh, we did, we ran a one day program on navigating change. Um, and we partnered with Punch Drunk. This is a, a, an immersive theater organization. And, um, and so this is like in London in a sort of a, a city that uh, resembles it's it's made up of two cities in one so there's a built city with uh, representing troy and and greece and the sort of ancient uh, greek 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 wars uh, long story short we sort of immersed our leaders in a in a sort of an unfamiliar uncomfortable space so we did a number of things which included blindfolds and all sorts of things um, as a way of uh, mirroring the kind of discomfort they feel uh, when you join the company, you go through change. Um, and the impact of that, I mean, it was very visible. The stories that people still tell to this day um, of that, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's quite remarkable. I mean, it was actually quite scary doing it because we, my, my boss and I facilitated it. And um, part of it, we did a simulation. And uh, let's just say it created, a, it made a lot of people uncomfortable. And so, you know, there's something about, whilst it was quite impactful, certainly emotionally and certainly in terms of me it was memorable um you're always sort of walking on the edge of of um <laughs> you know of impact or being exited from the company <laughs> if it goes completely wrong wow that's incredible isn't it because i think 
sometimes it, it shouldn't uh, you should have these sort of really memorable learning experiences as well i guess you've raised the bar now for future events that you run haven't you <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, raise the bar, and, and it might be that the bar stays there if, if it doesn't sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, if we don't do any more. But yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we were piloting, we are experimenting, and that's one of the things that we, one of the ways that we can get stuff done really in this global context is by, you know, piloting it and not, not presenting it as a fixed thing that is going to last forever. It's just that we want to test and learn. And so we're going to trial this with, with one function we're going to try this with a small group here to sort of limit the the sort of exposure, I guess, to risk. Um, and uh, and so now I'm in the process of having the conversation with the global counterparts to sort of, uh, I've written a whole memo and created videos that summarize the experience to say, hey, look, this is what we learned. Give them a bit of a taste of it um, and then look at what, what might it look like to scale that or at least to create the resources that someone could run with it and, and deploy it um, kind of locally as well. Great. The power of iteration, isn't it? And I think sometimes things that hold L&D back are the fact that they feel that everything should be really a polished program that's rolled out. And then it's the risk is even greater, isn't it? Whereas this way, it's sort of test and learn almost, isn't it? Yeah. And it sounds like that yeah. test and learn fits really, docks really well with Netflix wider culture of kind of testing and experimenting. So you're aligned yeah, there. Exactly. exactly. And there's something about thinking about, you know, to what extent do the interventions you're thinking about, to your point, Danny, marry with the the culture of the organisation? You know, um, uh, you know, I remember when I was at a scale up. Um, you know, we had created these sort of um, cheat sheets, and uh, you know, to help productivity and performance. And the response I get, I remember getting from some people was, "Oh, Kenny, this feels too polished. This feels too corporate." Um, and when you're in a startup scale up, it needs to feel quite scrappy. Um, and so, I mean, I had that drummed into me when I was a, when I was a consultant and you know what it's like, you know, you, you justify your existence in some extent to some degree as a consultant where you create these amazingly polished slides, but that doesn't work everywhere. And it certainly didn't work, um, uh, when I was at the sort of game company. So yeah, just rethinking about matching the intervention, right. To the sort of culture as well. Brilliant. So in terms of lessons, if you look back at the kind of career and things you've been involved with, your career what's the biggest lesson you've learned do you think wow what's the, big, the biggest <laughs> lesson i've learned there are so many well don't restrict yourself to one oh no go for a few we'll take we'll take you've got them yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, what's the biggest lesson i've learned um i know that i'm gonna forget forget some of them um i'd i'd start off with um i can share a few yeah i think mm. one of them is the importance of humility and where does that come from i think um you know as either as od as talent practitioners but just as you know as professionals we come in with our own set of values our own sort of fixed identity and actually whilst that's important to have a sense of self you know Carol Dweck talks about fixed mindsets, right, versus growth mindset. Actually, in some ways, for me, it's about fixed and unfixed. You know, growth is another thing entirely, but there's something about being unfixed, being malleable, being childlike, being open to feedback, being responsive to feedback, um, and not taking yourself too seriously, um, being able to laugh at yourself. Um, because I think that, um, you know, you're always then you're always learning, you're always evolving, and then you're going into that sort of growth space. So I think one of the biggest lessons for me is, um, is, is how to be flexible, you know, how to be adaptive, and be sort of, uh, and to sort of, um, uh, I guess, being, yeah, being open to and really receptive to, to sort of feedback and to um, evolving as a, as a person. So I think there's a lot of lessons I've learned on a sort of, um, how I show up as an employee and my own sort of sense of sense of growth. Um, and then there are, you know, lessons in terms of, you know, navigating corporates. I think this is one which, which we could have a whole 24 hour um, conversation around, not that anybody would want to listen to it, but, um, you know, corporations are, as you both know well, right? You know, they are inherently confusing, illogical at times, irrational, uh, hypocritical in many ways, particularly in the corporates that I've been in. Um, and if you don't know how to navigate that, I think you'll just, your mental health will just sort of plummet. And and so 
uh, there's something about just knowing how to how to play the corporate game, if I'm honest. You know, I think that um, uh, sometimes that looks like, um, uh, and not necessarily, I'm not talking necessarily about being overly political as such, but I think it sort of looks like, um, you know, we talked earlier about allies building the right relationships, um, knowing uh, when to give and take, um, knowing when to uh, uh, sort of uh, how you might need to make a mark so that you can build credibility um, in certain in certain cases. So I think there is just something about how do you just navigate organizations, how, you know, taking the time to understand what works at Netflix won't work at the BBC, for example, in terms of interventions and just taking time to sort of understand, well, what, what really works here? How does decisions, how do decisions get made here? Because it might ostensibly, you might think, well, it's the, it's the stated culture and values, but actually it's often the unwritten rules and it's the sort of these things which you've got to pay attention to and be, and be sort of wise about, hmm, okay, we're saying this, but really what really drives the needle? And so it's really taking stock and diagnosing how things work so you can sort of navigate the, the whirlwind that is corporate corporate life. I remember uh, that. No, my God, there are there are wisdom in those words. And if anybody's thinking of getting into organisation development, there's just so many things in there, aren't there? It's like, um, you know, context is king, isn't it? Um, your five step process that worked in one client won't work in another. And just understanding, like, to to change the system, you have to engage the system, don't you? And therefore, you engage the system on its terms, enter its grammar, and and then then work with it accordingly, don't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And language, you know, I. I I remember um, being in a, a leadership team meeting, our, our country leadership team meeting, and I um, I was talking about you know the importance of scale or the value of scale for for the sort of HR function, and I remember one person responding, sort of saying, um, you know, wh why is this why this obsession with scale? They had a bit of an adverse reaction to it, and I understood why because no one had ever sat down and explained to them, or just used their own language, and so little things like, you know, dropping the jargon dropping the OD and HR jargon and sort of thinking, how do I adapt uh, what I'm going to share to my client, to my end user? And it's all of that usual uh, relationship relationship stuff. So you spend your your days developing and supporting individuals and teams to, to grow and, and learn. What about your own development um, and mm -hmm. learning? What does that look like for you? Oh, really good question. Well, there was certainly the the program that we were on together, yeah. um, which is which is a good one. So just can we name drop? Can we name drop Steve? Yeah, can we name drop Steve? <laughs> of course we can. <laughs> so this is Steve Hearsome, isn't it? Who's uh, gonna uh, does um, supervision group supervision, doesn't he, for sort of practitioners? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Sort of the we've been circling around the name, so all the, the things. <laughs> so let's, just, let's name it as we like to say in OD. Right? Let's, let's name, name it. <laughs> a free plug for Steve and Steve, if you're listening, yeah. hello. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, big up, Steve. Um, yeah, I, it's such a good question, Danny. Sort of learning. Um, I mean, I, I I read a lot. So you know, you've got lots of books behind you there, and so similar to you both, I spend a lot of time reading podcasts, audio books. I try to listen to something every single day. So there's lots of reading, uh, feedback. I mean, I mentioned it earlier, but I would say working at Netflix, because of the, the feedback culture that exists, and to be really, really clear, we've got a lot of work to do. This isn't universal that everybody gives feedback in the way we should, so I don't want anyone to think. Otherwise, there's lots of work for the company to be done there. But that said, there is such an aspiration around it. And so it's a, you know, there was a book, I think it was by ooh, Robert Leahy, maybe, De De uh, Deliberately Developmental Organizations or something like that. And, um, and, and you know, feedback is a way of being deliberately developmental because, you know, once you're getting the, you know, real time feedback, it's such an experience, you know, um, and, uh, and I found that at Netflix. So um, getting feedback into is, is great for growth. And, and I don't mean just at, at work. I mean, my, my wife and my kids are great for giving me feedback <laughs> um, and uh, constantly working on stuff. And so that, that's sort of super helpful. I, I you know, external to Netflix, I do a fair bit of coaching and I find that really, really helpful for my growth. Um, and so I, I'm sort of into a lot of that sort of growth work. I think it was Carl Jung who said something like the greatest gift you can give to your child is to do your own work or something like that, or to do your own inner growth work. And so um, I remember going on a sort of psychological retreat sometime earlier in, in the year. Um, and this was for coaches 
had a sort of cycle spiritual dimension to it where they were looking at your life history and coaching you through some of the, the pain so there's a bit of psychodynamics involved in it and you know without wanting to sort of trigger your audience at all so you know do uh you know, advisory noted if uh, if you find these things difficult but um i don't think i cried as much in my life well probably since i was a kid as i had in this sort of retreat and it was very simple you know you were just invited to share your story and um but it had to be a story that was very impactful and difficult and uh everyone shared um and of course there's something about being in that environment which probably just uh unloosens everyone anyway and that was um really really powerful for me uh so there's that there's also therapy i've been you know spend a fair bit of time in therapy from a developmental perspective that's been really really helpful for my own own growth so um probably you'll notice the pattern there is that a very little of the last few number of years, I don't know how much, um, has involved formal classroom kind of training. And as and that's not to knock it, I think there's certainly a place for it. I did some work with Rafi Parks some time ago and uh, online training and things like that. Um, but in fact, going back, Steve, Steve's, I remember he would often talk about, uh, from a coaching perspective, you've got some people who, who sort of prefer the ICF sort of accreditation route and some people who prefer the supervision route. And I found that the supervision, the sort of very practical hands-on um, development has been pretty um, impactful for me. So again, apologies, that was a bit long. No, we, we touched on something really important, which about organisation development, because and it's an often used phrase, is like sort of self as instrument. And, you know, when you're going into organisations, when you're going into systems and you're creating change, you get so many things projected onto you. Um, and there's all sorts of different sort of psychodynamic things happening. So it is really important to do that work, isn't it? We have to be aware of what's our stuff, what's the system's stuff, how might this be triggering me? And and we have to go there. And I think sometimes we underestimate the work that has to be done to understand ourselves. And it's not easy, is it? We we like like you said, you know, it sounds like a you know quite a, a, a cathartic yet challenging course for you to do, but it makes you a better practitioner, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love the way you put that, Gary. You know, it's um, so much of the change. In fact, I, I can't remember who this was, but there was some research around, you know, let's say in the coaching space. Um, I think I remember reading it in Gerard Egan's book on um, the skilled helper some, some time ago. And he talked about, um, he said, you may familiar may remember the research, but he talked about that when they looked at all the methods and models that, that sort of um, make a difference to the coaching space, actually, the, the thing that was um most impactful i guess was the relationship between the you know consulting or coach and the client and that relationship and really you know what what you're doing what you're bringing to that relationship garen is presence aren't you you're bringing mm. your presence into that space and and so you're right i think uh you know it's not going to be you know a one year or two year masters or, or reading a book on od or a couple of tools that's going to do it there's a entire presence that and how you interact with the system and the and and your uh, client. So anyway, yeah, yeah. No, I I could definitely identify that. I, th I always remember when I think it was midway through one of those sort of transitional times, and someone looked at me and went, "You look really discombobulated," because <laughs> it's because it's all the stuff, isn't it? But um... yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a lifetime's work as well, isn't it? It's not yeah. you know, it's, you don't get to the point where I'm done. I've I've sorted I've it all out. This. I've mastered this. Um, I think yeah. every interaction you have and every new client you're working with or every new team brings up something different and you learn mm. from you learn about yourself as much as you do about um, others coming to that kind of thinking about that so if there's somebody who's thinking about a career in OD or they're in an HR role and they're thinking I quite like the sound of OD what advice would you have for them if they're, they're looking to get into a, a more OD centric mm. role yeah mm, good question well as usual I'd ask them why to, to reflect on why that's something that that they want to do and, and what what's drawn them to this sort of space so I, i'll assume they've they've answered all of those sort of more elementary type uh first principles kinds of questions um and then i mean definitely definitely do the reading and um you know but, but even more than that i think there's something about that self-work that we talked about earlier um, so be, being willing to do that self work, um, whether that be coaching, supervision, 
Um, but it's really just, as Gary was mentioning, really understanding yourself. I think that's, and it also has just amplification of sort of benefits in terms of your family and your friends and, you know, other sort of aspects. So um, I'd say that. And then, of course, you know, looking at some of the courses that are online, whether that, I mean, I don't want to name drop <laughs> courses because they're, you know, all different courses exist, you know, we're not, <laughs> not, nothing we're partial here to, to one particular um but you know yeah going i don't know if you guys have a website so maybe go along to to garen and danny's um site and wherever their linkedin pages i'm sure there'll be lots of resources there um but yeah i think that the the education is important but um i think over and above all develop your curiosity uh, i would just say i think that's probably something that's helped me a lot um um you know looking at things, trying to and understand what is this? So Socrates used to ask that. It was a famous Socratic question, you know, what is it? You know, and it, I think Socrates was eventually, I mean, actually he was eventually killed, I think, for poisoned actually for 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 being such a nuisance. So <laughs> maybe not the greatest um, bit of advice. But um but I do think there's something about um being really curious and 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 to look underneath the surface of things and developing that wherever you are because um, that's going to be really, really, really critical um, uh, in that sort of space. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kenny. Um, I've learned okay. so much from it as well. You've kind of really given us a great insight into to what you do, the challenges that you face, kind of what brought you to here as well. I guess some of the words I'm taking away are the importance of candor, humility, uh, iteration, flexibility, and adaptability as well. And, you know, it's not just about a role, it's about what you bring it as well. So uh, a huge thank you um, for your time. And, and thanks for shedding a light on a fascinating company that we all interact with, but we often wonder what goes on behind the scenes as well. So, so thank you so much. Pleasure, pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been really, really good to be here. And thanks, Danny, for, for all your questions as well.